Hello, hello. Welcome, welcome. Good morning, everyone. Good morning, Kristen. Good morning. Good morning. I am priceless. Good morning, NC Phillips. Good morning, Kristen. How's it Hi going? Hi there. Yay, we made it happen. Yeah, we did it. How are you? I'm good. I'm good. Apologies for the last minute switch, but I That's appreciate okay. your flexibility. Good morning, everybody. I'm Dr. Zelina of AccuVita Acupuncture. Uh, today's series is Conversations to Empower, and today's guest is Kristen Hauser, who's a licensed acupuncturist. Her and I both completed our master's program together at SCU out in Whittier. And she's a very accomplished healer. Why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself? Yeah, thanks. I'm so glad to be here. And I'm so like happy to see you and um, yeah, be in community in this way. Um, Me too. So yeah, my name's, my name's Kristen Hauser. I'm a Kansas native, but I live in Southern California. And as Alina said, we went to school together. I got my, um, my degree in acupuncture and East Asian medicine. And now I'm practicing in Southern California and have been for about five years now. Uh, my focus has been on women's health since the beginning. And even prior to that, I was teaching yoga and attending births as a birth doula. And so I'd been sort of immersed in this world as I graduated and started my practice. And I had some great mentorship with an acupuncturist in Orange County. And um, during those first few years, I also completed a somatic sex educator training uh, because I was just recognizing that as I was working with women through fertility challenges and menstrual health issues and pregnancy and postpartum, there was just kind of this missing layer of um, talking about sex, talking about sexuality and how your relationship to sexuality evolves and is like so core and fundamental to your health and vitality overall. So yeah, that's a little bit about like my journey. I'm also a mom. I have two young kids. So I'm like on this path myself of motherhood and um, embodiment and healing and, and yeah, just all the things. Amazing. Wow. That's a lot. But that's yeah. amazing. Yeah. You know, um, and you're also a yogi. Yeah, yeah. You're also a yogi. Um, you're a doula. Yeah, birth, I don't really, birth doula, right? Yeah, so I don't really identify with the term birth doula anymore. Um, okay. So both of my children were born outside of the system. So both were born at home. My firstborn was a home birth with a midwife, so with a, like a licensed professional. And my second was actually unassisted. So I had a free birth um, in 2019. And yeah, since then, I've just really more aligned myself with the term radical birth keeper or really assisting women- um, outside of the system who don't really want to participate in the medical ideology. And um, not that I don't think there's a place for that, but that's just where my alignment and calling is most sort of leading me to in this moment, at least. So yeah, Absolutely. I don't really attend birth in the hospital setting at all. Okay, but you do you um, assist in home births? Yeah, I, I think I'm like just getting to the point because I'm my daughter's seven, she'll be 18 months this month. And I'm just sort of getting to the point where I'm like, yeah, I could go to a birth again and feeling like that is more of a possibility now that my daughter's a little bit older. Um, okay. And I think that will definitely come more and more as my kids grow. But really my focus right now is um, clinical, like being in clinic, like you, I think you're in your clinic right now, it looks yeah. like. Um, <laughs> so yeah, doing clinical practice, working with women one-on-one, -on -one, it's just so uh, needed. And also I founded a um, online sort of embodiment education based um, platform where I'm creating courses and content that sort of supplement the clinical work that I do and honor a group container or group process. So I've found that, you know, and I'm sure you can relate to this, like you're working with someone one on one and sometimes there's a layer of emotion or shame um, or something that comes up and while it's really profound and can definitely be healed on a one-on-one -on -one basis or relationship or within that container. Um, mm -hmm. I know for myself being in group processes and especially when it comes to our sexuality, our cycles, like navigating the challenges of new motherhood, 
it is just really beneficial to have that like group container and reflection and witnessing. So I'm sort of creating courses with that in mind. And um, those are through um, wombmedicine.com. So yeah, that's kind of all the things that I'm doing right now. I have a lot going on, but that just sort of works for my personality, I guess. Amazing. So the group offerings that you have um, are, are group classes, like group coaching? Yeah. Group, group so, classes? Um, the, it's, so I have um, a couple that are ongoing. I have like a self-paced digestive reset that you can do at any time alone, but I also offer it twice a year live. Um, so like once you're in that um, digestive reset for hormonal resilience, like you can take it with me live twice a year and you can also do it like on your own self-paced. And then nice. um, a lot of my courses are also live. So I'm teaching a live course right now about period health overall. It's called Periods During a Pandemic because I've just noticed in the last months, like women are really struggling with their cycles, struggling with lots of um, issues related to stress resilience and related to like stress disease, essentially. Um, right. So tell us a little bit about why like why are periods during a pandemic so important yeah well i think it you know it's like we're the period is sort of like a baseline of our health right so it's like especially if you're not on hormonal contraceptives um it's giving you details about your overall system like how you're doing throughout the month hormonally relationally sexually um, really all these different layers and it's uh, it, it can really be just like a guiding light for your health and I've noticed that a lot of women are having more issues with their cycles and I think that's just a totally normal human biology response right we're going yes. through like immense change and stress and stress our resilience yeah, <laughs> stress our, resilience. Our, yeah exactly stress resilience um, our physiology is reflecting that and um, I really want to help women see that that's it, you know, it can be frustrating. Yes. Like not to minimize anyone's symptomology if they are experiencing symptoms, but it's like, we also have to be like, okay, great. My body is intelligent and like showing me that it's absorbing and reflecting what's happening in the environment and what can I learn about that and how can I work with it? So yeah, I just tend, tend to see like, we need the practical pieces. Like we need to make the lifestyle changes maybe do some dietary stuff, you know, work on um, all of that and also like have reverence for what the body is able to communicate and, and do really, because it's so intelligent to not ovulate during a pandemic, honestly. So, right. Right. Because if you're yeah, feeling absolutely. stressed, like your body is not sensing safety for, pre for producing life. And that's, that's normal. Yeah. We actually have, um, uh... A viewer commenting, that's interesting because I have felt my period pains more intensely this year. This is one woman yeah. party. And I can absolutely relate and appreciate that. And I feel like myself included, a lot of the women I'm working with right now are really um, not just becoming aware, but really um, diving a little bit deeper to understand our menstrual cycle because it's an innate intelligence, just like you're, you're um, expressing the womb is very intelligent. Um, our bodies are very intelligent. Yeah. It's, it's, it's its own intelligent ecosystem. And definitely what we are being exposed to and what we are experiencing um, has an impact on how our periods will flow or, or not yeah. flow, how we'll, we'll ovulate or not ovulate. And I think it's just a beautiful time because we are, we are because we're in a pandemic, we have extra yeah. time to be indoors and have like a lot of people aren't working or some people are working less yeah. um, and, and granted that's stressful, but it's also, I think a beautiful time to, to have a moment to step back and look and observe at the things that maybe weren't working. Because what mm -hmm. I noticed is that uh, prior to the pandemic, January, February, and part of March, you know, the, the main complaint, the across the board, that was a common consensus is basically I'm stressed and I don't have enough time. Yeah. Um, and I always knew that this is just not uh, sustainable for a very long time. It's not a sustainable lifestyle. Yeah. And so when the, nice. when the pandemic hit, I, I kind of welcomed it because I was like, yes, I can take a break and spend more time with my daughter and go on nature walks and whatever. Mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, we have these different sets of, of people where we are 
you know, looking for the silver linings and uh, working with what we have, but also delving a little bit deeper into our health and wellness and even our spirituality. And then for, for a lot of the women I'm working with, they're really diving a little bit deeper and deeper, which I think is such a beautiful time to do that considering, you know, everything that's going on. Um, and, you know, you mentioned that some women are not ovulating. That's, mm -hmm. a, that's such an intelligent response to what's happening right now. Totally. It is. Yeah. Um, can you tell us a little bit about um, like what in, in your line of work, what you have come across that you have felt the need to create this um, like what examples of working with women have inspired you to become more uh, of a group class kind of mm -hmm. uh, make, yeah. make these offerings available virtually to be yeah. able to reach more people, more women. So I think the, like it really started when I was working, doing a lot of fertility work and I was starting to recognize like just that I was asking questions of women, like about their cycles and they'd either one never considered it. Like, why would I, you know, like, I'm sure you asked this question a lot, Selena, like, you know, did you have any clotting in your blood? What color was it? What was the consistency? And they're like, I don't know, like, kind of like I was speaking a foreign language to them, right? It's I like, know, I, I always get like, oh my gosh, I never thought about it. But yeah, it's like, not as cloudy as last month. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No or one's like, asked, ever asked me this many questions about yeah. my period. <laughs> or started talking about cervical fluid. And it's like, well, what's, what is that? Um, so I was just like, there's just a huge gap. Like we live in a society that is not sexually initiated. And part of that is not having an education around menstrual literacy, around menstruation, mm -hmm. around hormones um, and how our bodies work. And so I was like, okay, I want to help the, you know, I'm trying to help these women to conceive, to get pregnant. They're having challenges and they don't have a baseline. Like they don't, they need to reclaim baseline knowledge of how their body works if they can, so they can move forward through the fertility process with agency and like Absolutely. really rooted in their own power and not be going to all these doctor's appointments and not really knowing what's going on or not knowing um, what the person's talking about. I mean, I've sat, sat like countless hours just like trying to explain to women and help them understand what the process is when they're working with a reproductive endocrinologist and going through some type of ART, which is like assisted reproductive technology. Um, so it's like a lot of times women just sitting, like going through the motions of these fertility treatments um, and needing someone to really say like, look, this is what I mean when I say this, this is what we're talking about. Mm -hmm. So going through any healing process, if you're disoriented to your own body system, it doesn't work like it's just it's, it's not enough it's not enough yeah it's really a challenge for your body to then orient into a new like platform of healing and awareness if you don't Absolutely. know what's going on so I was like okay something's gotta like this has got to change and t teaching people about it one-on-one -on -one, like I can do that like it's possible but it's not really as effective as like doing in a group, group container, setting. like yeah. having really inviting people to take responsibility also for the process. Um, and then, yeah, I can focus clinically like on that part. You know, I want to like when I'm doing the clinical work, it's not that I don't want to be doing education as well, but like I want to be focusing on the herbal formula. I want to be focusing on the point prescriptions. Like totally. I want to yes. be detail oriented. Mm hmm. So it just was like, I've got to reorganize this so it's more efficient and effective overall. And yeah, there's just like countless other examples. Um, like another one that comes to mind is like postpartum sexuality. That is a huge one. Healing, healing the vulva, vagina, womb, space after birth. Um, women are really struggling. And part of the reason why they're struggling is because they don't know other women are struggling. Yeah. You know? Yep they think something's wrong with them and that, and that this is only happening to them. Yeah. I exactly. can totally relate to that. We all yeah, do it. I think it's, um, it's really great. You mentioned a couple of things that I wanted to touch on. You mentioned, um, how our society is not sexuality oriented. That is super key because, uh, you know, sexuality is almost taboo 
And it is. Es- especially for us women, of course. Yeah. It's like we're not allowed to be sexual. And then as moms, we're definitely not allowed to be sexual. Definitely uh, not. And then, you know, that also ties into normalizing breastfeeding, which I'm a big advocate yeah. for. Uh, because it becomes a sexual thing and it's a primal instinct really to be able to nurse and nourish our child. Um, And then the other thing is you talked about, you know, a lot of women don't know, you know, how the, how the body works, what it is, what it's like to work with an endocrinologist. Some, some women don't even know how the cycle works. They don't know the difference between luteal phase and follicular phase and those types of things. Um, and obviously, it's not, not you know, nobody's fault. Um, not their fault. Not no. their fault at all. No. Um, because that is information that just isn't commonly available. It's not available in, in, in school, for sure. And, um, and unless you're in a medical profession, it's really just not available to you in college either. Yeah. Um, and that's something that I think maybe that responsibility should lie in the parents, um, but we live in such a society that is just not family friendly no. that most parents, at least parents in the 80s, 90s, didn't have time to explain how the cycle flows. And maybe they didn't even know how the cycle flows. I was going to say, like, they often, they didn't know either. <laughs> right, right, so right. So it's like, this is perpetuated through lineage system, like through your lineage, right? If your mom didn't know much about menstruation or sexuality, then you're more likely to also stay in the dark in that way. Yeah, my my mom didn't even talk to me about it. I learned about it through classmates in school. Um, uh, let's see what one mo- woman said. Yeah. I want my nieces and grandchildren, including the men, to know all of this. Yes. I did a bad job of that, but I'm learning now. It's yeah, all there's, good. There's can, always make changes time today for, and tomorrow. Yeah, for repair. There's always time for repair. Yeah, and I think, I think, um, and you know, I know one woman party personally. She has a son, and it would be great if all moms showed their sons this information too, uh, obviously daughters, but because one beautiful thing about tribal culture and um, indigenous cultures is that moon time has always been revered, has always been respected um, and honored uh, by the entire community, not just the women. You know, women gathered together in their own lodge, had their own time while the community and, and the rest of the community and the men, you know, had their separate lodge and did, um, you know, their, their practice separately. Um, but yeah, I think we live in a day, ta- in a day, time and day where now ignorance is really a choice. There is so much information out there and, um, it's wonderful that, you know, people like you and I are, are educating others on these things that are our own natural it's our natural physiology. It's our own innate intelligence. Um, and I think, I think it is helpful for women to know as much as possible about the cycle because then they are able to make the most informed choices. And informed choices is such an empowering thing. Yeah. Um, we give, I say we, including myself, like all people in general, we have given so much of our power to these doctors and um, to people that we think are going to help us but a lot of doctors don't dive deep, don't um, inquire, don't even ask you what your goals are, what, is, what it is that you want to do. And, 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 and sometimes, you know, the system is set up in such a way that there's just no allotted time to be able to get into all of that in one visit. I mean, yeah. even, you, even for us, like, we want to focus on the clinical when we're, when we're working with patients. We want to focus on the treatment, getting them better, putting in the right points, um, putting in the right herbal prescription. Whereas we still have to figure out how to give this information to them so that they're feeling empowered. Yeah. Um, so I think it totally. is beautiful to, to have a separate kind of education platform where you can say, hey, you know, like I have a patient with PCOS and she, um, you know, I'm working with her and I'm giving her her herbs and her acupuncture, but she needs to, you know, you also need to check out this course. Um, because you're going to get all of the information you need from this course to be able to, to um, be more mindful, more self-aware, and make better choices, basically, at the end of the day. Yeah. Um, what about... Um, so what have you noticed about cycles right now in the people that you're working with, in the women you're working with? Um, 
I think someone in the comments What's mentioned happening? like they're having more pain this year, this like this year. And I would say that's definitely common, more irregularity, just like a little yeah. less predictable than before. Um, Why do you think that is? I think it's just because of the, what we're being exposed. Like, I just think overall, we are kind of swimming in a collective fear right now because of yeah. the threats that are out there. So people identify threats and assess risk in very unique ways. So some yeah. people are really scared of the, of getting sick of the pandemic, you know, in general, like really fearful of the virus itself. Some people are fearful of um, economic collapse. Some people are fearful of like government overreach. These are all sort of creating the same physiological response inside. What does of, fear create in the body? Um, what I would say is like it create, it is sort of a nor nervous system state. So it is a type of nervous system reaction and it does create essentially stress hormones and stress physiology. Um, and that decreases our capacity to create sex hormones. So to create hormones that would, you know, benefit our cycle. So the body's just sort right. of prioritizing survival. And right. even if it's not to the point where it's like shutting down menstruation totally, it's still changing your internal hormonal landscape enough that it creates some shifts in your physical symptoms or like how your menstrual flow is or um, yeah, just like what your experience is of your menstrual cycle, I would say. Right. Yeah. I mean, fear basically puts you in a fight or flight state. It, in, it engages the parasympathetic system. And I, I was recently uh, sharing about this uh, last week when I did um, the Express Decompress 3 Day Challenge. I talked about the nervous system and how it can get into fight or flight. When it's in fight or flight or survival mode, um, all the other processes kind of shut down because all of the resources are going to the nervous system to get ready to fight yeah. the threat or to, you know, run away. Yeah. It, it um, like shunts blood to your major muscle groups, essentially. So yeah. blood moves away from the internal organs and towards your limbs. And um, so you can prepare to fight or flee for sure. Yeah. And so how does this impact the, the, the womb, the sex hormones um, after a prolonged amount of time, do you think? Yeah, so I think with prolonged amount of time, then you would move into the potential of losing your cycle of, of like losing ovulation and downregulating hormonal production to the point where um, your lining's not really, like your uterine um, endometrial lining in the womb is not really regenerating itself, is not really... Um, like going through that growth shedding phase, growth shedding, mm -hmm. you know? Um, and yeah, I think it just, it creates, and I think it, it these sort of nervous system states or like these um, emotional states, like they do in a way perpetuate themselves if you can't um, get the support you need to get out of them or have right. the tools that you need to sort of reorient yourself to your environment or whatever it is going to be um, to get yourself out of that state. Yeah. Okay. yeah. So, so being in a prolonged state of fight or flight essentially will throw off an, um, a menstrual cycle, start making it irregular and possibly long-term, maybe it'll disappear. Yeah, I would right? say, I mean, everyone's body, everyone's physiology is unique and will respond in its own way and in its own timing. But if you look at like the overall trajectory of how hormones work and function, then yeah, if you're um, in a very activated um, sort of sympathetic arousal response or even into deep parasympathetic collapse, uh, like a dorsal vagal response, um, that is going to like shunt blood and resources away from your ovaries, away from brain communicating with the ovaries and therefore like away from healthy menstruation. And definitely the reasoning that your body has for that is that like 
if you're in this level of activation, whether it's fight, flight, um, sympathetic arousal, or whether it's dorsal vagal shutdown and collapse, then that's not a good time to like reproduce and sustain life. Absolutely. That's so, not a time to create. Yeah. So it's just you about, can't like, create under stress. No, it's just about helping the body to like orient and ground into more safety, more resilience, um, greater capacity to hold the tension that's happening right now. Because Absolutely. I do believe like everyone has that innate healing capacity to mm -hmm. be with what, what life is offering and like grow through that. I agree a hundred percent. We all have that capacity. And I think, you know, I just want to, um, kind of remind people that our sexual energy is our most powerful energy. It's the power of creation. Yeah. Um, and that coincides with our sacral chakra, which is the second chakra. Um, if any of you are yogis or follow the chakra system, um, you know, it's all about creation, creativity and creation. And so that, that in itself is reason why to, to have the motivation to want to keep your sexual health energy and yeah. or your menstrual cycle, your womb, you know, all of it is related, your nervous system. It is. Um, and so, so what kind of tips can you, um, so enlightening, yay, I'm glad you like it. Um, what kind of tips can you offer? What is something like one or two things that uh, women can do in this time right now where we're feeling like, like, so I want to talk about tips, but I also want to talk about um, uh, the, the cycle uh, from a TCM perspective, because that's, yeah. our, that's our specialty. That's our stuff. And I want people to know how the cycle relates to, you know, the universe, really, because it relates yeah. to nature, it relates to the moon cycle, it relates to the seasons and, and all these things. But um, so, so give us two tips that you think would be really helpful right now in this in this kind of time shift that we're in um, that will help us to be more in tune with our wombs um, to try to gather some information um, to bring it back into balance. Yeah, I would say like narrowing it down to two is of course a challenge, but like the things that I'm just going to go two with what's three. coming to mind. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so I would say creating like a, a womb, check in with yourself every day, like really checking in and sensing and feeling what's there. Like, so cultivating capacity to bring your awareness into your pelvis and like really deep into your pelvis and feeling like what, what's there right now. Um, I'm doing it now. Yeah. Like you can just do it. Like you might, you're, if you're listening, you can just do it right now and like really feel like, okay, you can bring your you know, we're talking a lot, your awareness may be more in your head, like processing, but what does it feel like to just bring your awareness down your spine and into your pelvic bowl and just be with the energy that's there? And yeah. um, that could arrive as a sensation or an image or a, like an emotional feeling um, and cultivating that as sort of a daily practice throughout your cycle can be really helpful. What are some questions that we can ask our womb, wombs when mm. we're doing our womb check-in? Like, yeah. do you need I water? Just, do you need rest? Yeah, I would just say, like, what is it that you need or what do you want to share with me today? Like, keeping it, usually keeping it pretty um, simple is good. Like, just slowing down and really being with yourself uh, can go a long way and give you a lot of feedback that you maybe didn't know like your body was even able to communicate that with you and at first if you're like really new to this territory it might feel kind of strange like right. i'm asking my womb what it needs or like i'm what what is happening but just keep going like keep trusting yourself and trusting that like your body does have the capacity to communicate with you and let you know what it is that it needs yeah, I think that's that in and of itself is such a solid practice to cultivate and, and develop um, starting today. I mean, it's September 1st. It's a great day to start a new habit, a new practice. Um, because, I mean, myself included, I started my womb healing journey probably, uh, you know, just before I got, I got pregnant. 
And after I became a mom, kind of forgot about her. Yeah. To be honest with you. <laughs> kind of forgot about her other than like, you know, the physical piece where I was like binding myself and whatever. Yeah. But I wasn't checking in like I had been in the past. And, you know, lately I've, I've started to cultivate and develop that practice again. And, you know, if I'm being really honest, it did feel a little bit foreign, like, like, okay, I'm asking my womb how she's doing. Yeah. Like, what, what, how, how, what, what's happening here? Yeah. You know? Yeah. <laughs> but eventually, as you keep doing it, it, it becomes, you start to get a connection going. And yeah. you do start to feel that intimacy, that, um, that communication, because it is an innate intelligence that we have. And we are completely able to communicate with our wombs um, if we give ourselves the time and space to do it. Um, yeah. Any other tips? Yeah. So the other one that's coming to mind, because I love to give like really practical stuff too, mm -hmm. um, is just being sure you're eating enough, being sure you're eating regularly and consistently mm -hmm. and like maintaining stable blood sugar, like the womb and the ovaries, just, they love to have stable blood sugar. They love to know that it's, that there's enough nourishment to go around and um, yes, so that self-nourishment piece is just, it's really important. Yeah, it really is. Absolutely. I didn't even think about that. I think about nourishment because I'm still nourishing Luna through my mm. breast milk. And so I think about like, oh, I better eat because I got to feed her too, you know, yeah. <laughs> but, but I need it too. My, yeah. mom, my ovaries need it. Yeah, it's, for it's sure. such a powerful force and such a powerful energy. We definitely need to honor it more yeah. um, and make time and space for that. So let's talk about uh, menstrual cycles from a TCM perspective. Can you yes. give us like a foundational layout? Uh, when is yin time? When is yang time? Yeah. What does it so, mean for the body? So, yeah, I like to kind of keep it, you know, I think as you can, I'm sure as you can relate, like learning Chinese medicine is kind of like learning a new language. Like it's totally. a complete new orientation towards the body. And a lot of it is rooted in like one of the first concepts we learn in, I think, like TCM theory is yin and yang, like these two um, interdependent energy forces that always contain the seed of transformation in them, um, but give a little bit of polarity to the experience and allow us to compare and contrast things in a dynamic way. So yin energy, um, I mean, I'm sure you're like people have heard you speak about yin and yang, but I'll just break it down a little bit. So yin is, um, it's like sort of more density and substance. It's um, fluid or dark, um, where yang energy is like movement and, and brightness, um, more like the sun, where yin would be more like the moon. Um, yang is associated with sort of the motive force of life, like how we, you know, generate energy and move things forward. So within the, the menstrual cycle is really rooted in yin and blood. So it's, it's essentially mostly about yin. It's mostly about blood. Um, but there is this, of course, to interdependence with the yang um, motive force and how you move your menstrual cycle forward. So I, I think of the yin time or the, the most yin time to be menstruation because that's like a very internal process. That's when um, blood is, you know, is leaving the body. So that's also yin substance. And it's generally a time to slow down and take it a little bit easier on yourself. Totally. And then what's, yeah, go ahead. Sorry, I was just going to say totally. I always tell my patients um, days one through three of your cycle, like just rest no exercise, you know, yeah. take a break. Yeah. Cause it's yeah, yin time. Yin really is like for going within. And I think I want to mention too for moms, cause I know we're both moms and like we both have businesses and stuff. And like, I know as a mom, like it's not always possible to really like take the day off or like not do anything. Right. But it has to be an internal um, practice of slowing down. It's like you maybe still have to do all the things, right? You still have to make the breakfast and do take of care course. of your daughter and do the breastfeeding and um, do all those things. But it's like, can you be slower inside? Can you be slower with yourself and more gentle with how you approach your day? Mm -hmm. So I, I just want to add that because I know I don't, I, I know how it feels to be like, oh, but I can't slow down. It's, it's like, okay, you can slow down internally. Like you can give yourself more grace internally for those first few days. 
and then or maybe make, even trim off one or two one or two things off that to-do list yeah exactly on those days yeah totally yes so rest day one yes three. got it yeah rest um, up lift up those legs yes and then feet up. like the uterine lining essentially like it starts rebuilding pretty quickly and it and those and the follicles start to grow again and then we're building yin like estradiol's increasing we're building yin again and in the building of yin, you're also building the capacity for yang. So you're building the capacity to transform that energy into yang. And um, then at that point, like a, the point of ovulation is that transformation period. So if you struggle with transition or you struggle um, during that ovulation phase, it usually is like a, um, like we might think of it as chi stagnation or some type of transformation that's not happening as smoothly as it could from the yin part of the, the cycle to the more yang phase of the cycle. Um, and I'm sorry, so that is when progesterone occurs. to um, increase. Is that right? So yeah, after ovulation, um, there's a, yeah, there's a little delay or something. Let's see. Okay, so after ovulation, then you move into your luteal phase and ovulation triggers the increase in progesterone and that's a yang hormone. So it warms the base, the, it, it's what increases your basal body temperature and sustains your uterine lining. So for potential implantation. Um, so once that happens, like you are in a more yang phase of the cycle, but within that yang is the seed of yin, right? Is the seed of the transformation that will happen when you start bleeding again. So right. that's kind of like how I look at it. I look at it as like moving from, from utmost yin to um, yang within yin to utmost yang and then uh, yin within yang for the luteal phase and then moving into bleeding time again. It's beautiful. It's such a beautiful like cycle, just how it, it also um, is completely aligned with the lunar cycle as well. Waxing, waning, yeah. full moon, new moon, um, yeah. the seasons, you know, winter could be like uh, your yin time, your bleeding time. Summer can be yeah. your ovulation winter is like time. bleeding time. That's what I love. Yeah, so and much. you can. That, that's why I love Chinese medicine so much because it's so in tune with nature. Me too. Like that's definitely what drew me to it. Is just like it is a different orientation towards your body that really aligns with the alchemical processes of our natural world. Right, right, and that's what we have to remember. This is what I like to remind everybody that I work with, and even my family is like mm -hmm. we are beings of the natural world and we've lost that connection to nature technology is amazing and it's very helpful yes but if definitely. we're losing our connection if we're losing our connection to nature if we're not you know if being around trees or grass is foreign to us uh, we are going to have disharmonies that can later turn into dis-ease um, the more we connect with nature the more harmonized we're going to feel internally and we're going to radiate and vibrate that energy and that frequency outwards towards the people we're around, the people we love, into our work and into yeah. our everyday lives. Um, I'd like to open it up for questions. I don't know if anybody's going yeah. to have any questions. I know That's that good. one one person had a question that we weren't able to address, and she mentioned something about POF. Let me look. Oh, premature uh, premature ovarian failure. Have you also seen a growth in POF lately? I am priceless. I don't know if she's still here. It was a while back. but Okay, um, I'll, I can um, answer that. Um, sure. I, in my own practice, I haven't, but I can imagine that um, changes in, yeah, in ovarian function would be possible right now. So um, that's talking about premature ovarian failure. So that's when, like, the ovaries right. just kind of start or stop stop ovulating stop ovulating like at a younger than normal age so yeah i know that's a really frustrating condition and a really challenging place to be in especially if you're wanting to conceive and even if you're not if you're just wanting to maintain your like menstrual vitality um you know into your 40s or whatever it, yeah mm -hmm. that's challenging for sure 
I have seen a couple of patients um, that have been experienced. They've either been diagnosed with PCOS or um, they're just not ovulating. They don't have a, 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 you know, like a a, A solid diagnosis, a solid diagnosis, but they're telling me they're not ovulating or they're not menstruating. Um, So yeah, there is, there is some of that going on. Um, What is the normal age that ovulation stops? It's different for everybody. I think it varies between um, like, 40 or 50, right? I would Somewhere say like there. 45 to 50, like ovulation is going to be less regular after 40, but you're still probably going to have um, ovulatory cycles at that time. And then, yeah, it just varies. I'd say from 45 on. Yeah. I think but it can um, happen younger. Like it can be as early as 40. That's possible. I think sometimes also um, depending on, on your, your mother's history or the yeah. other women in your family that can kind of give you an idea as well. Um, but you know, as, as I always say, genetic gen- genes don't necessarily, um, you know, are the, the end all be all, um, because we can also adapt to our, adapt our bodies to a different environment. Um, because genes actually don't get expressed, uh, uh, outside. I'm not saying this right. Genes are only expressed in the right environment. So yes. if you have the gene, but, but, you know, you're doing everything right. You're super healthy. Um, you know, you don't have to worry about that sometimes. Um, the homeboy, Jose, asks, any info on Qigong? Qigong is amazing. Mm-hmm. Um, do you want to answer that? Um, you know, it's it's not something that I practice consistently enough to feel like I have, like, a good answer. Do you want? Do you have something you could add or say about that? Um, you know, qi, qigong, qigong, I find it to be... Um, Comparable to pranayama, having a pranayama practice or a breathwork practice, yeah. I do find that that qigong can be very powerful. Um, I'm big on meditation. I don't practice a lot of qigong either, but um, there are a lot of really good exercises out there can, that can be incorporated into your daily practice uh, simply just to boost your own internal energy, boosting your qi, yeah. your life force. Um, so I would definitely recommend it. Um, I know that qigong has been around for thousands of years. And it's been linked to reduced, um, reduced levels of, of hypertension, which is high blood pressure, reduced levels of um, high cholesterol, blood sugar, things like that. Um, definitely helps with stress. It can help with pain. Um, it can help with mental health issues and imbalances. Um, it can help with digestive health. And it can absolutely help with hormonal and menstrual health. Mm-hmm. Um, for sure. So, you know, just do a Qigong search on Google or YouTube and, and um, you know, find some videos and I think you're, you'll be good to go. Yeah. <laughs> Let's see if there's any other questions. Hi guys. All right. Um, I don't think I see any more. Okay. Um, you guys, thank you all so much for joining and watching. Um, if I don't have any, Sorry about that. If I don't have any technical challenges, I will be uploading this video onto IGTV and or YouTube, my YouTube channel. Um, so I'll let you guys know if, if any of you guys just joined and you missed the beginning or you, you were here in the beginning, but you missed the end. Um, I will try to upload it. Uh, Kristen, thank you so much for sharing all of your yes. knowledge and all of your wisdom. Just as a reminder, um, we will be doing this again. Um, And also, um, if any of you are interested in learning more from Kristen, uh, as she mentioned earlier, she is doing offerings virtually, uh, different classes for digestive health, hormonal health, menstrual health. The period during a pandemic course sounds amazing. Um, And I I think that starts on Thursday. So please, Mm -hmm. you know, follow her and join in on one of her offerings. And then I will see you guys next time. Anything else you wanted to say, Kristen? No, just thanks for having me. It's so great to see you. And um, yeah, I would love to to reconnect soon. Yeah, let's do it. Um, maybe after your course and you can tell us how it went. Yeah. And thanks for, uh, thanks for watching, everyone. Yeah, thanks for watching. Have a wonderful Tuesday and the rest of your week, guys. Bye, everybody. All right, you too. Bye.